Today we're going to talk about positron electron tomography, also known as PET scanning. And this is also a new addition to the A-level physics syllabus as a part of medical physics. And it's one that I really like because it combines radioactivity with medical physics. So PET scanning is a special type of medical diagnosis with radioactive tracers. What is a radioactive tracer? Well, a radioactive tracer is a radioactive substance, as the name suggests, that can be absorbed by our tissue in order to study the structure and functions of organs in the body. So we all know that radioactive substances emit certain particles like alpha particles, beta particles, or also gamma radiation um, in order to stabilize itself. And more often than not, alpha particles and gamma par beta particles can travel through a pretty good amount of matter, um, provided that the matter is not extremely dense. And gamma rays can travel through a lot of matter. Uh, it's really high energy and it's really hard to stop a gamma ray. So this means that you're going to have substances inside your body that emit these particles and you somehow detect it from the outside, hence giving you a view of inside your body, if that makes sense. So what happens? A radioactive isotope is bound to an organic molecule, for instance, glucose or water. This is like something that already exists in our body, so it will know where to go. And then they will gather in the brain or other places as well that you want to scan, um, places where you fear that you might have a cancerous tissue growing, for instance. So, so, so to start it off, let's just first talk about radioactive tracers. An example of a radioactive tracer is fluorodeoxyglucose. And this is when um, the fluorine nucleus goes through beta plus decay. So it's a radioactive isotope of fluorine, and it will go through beta plus decay, and it will emit a positron in order to stabilize itself. Um, otherwise, the rest of the, the new molecule um, the glucose part, it's actually an organic molecule that naturally occurs in the body. So the way that you do it is you attach the fluorine 18, which is radioactive, to glucose molecules by replacing oxygen atoms to form this. So you, you introduce this fluorodeoxyglucose, 18 fluorodeoxyglucose, into a patient. They can ingest it, they can take it um, by their mouth, or they could also have it injected into their bloodstream. Um, and then the radioactive tracer will flow around the body and it will preferentially gather in high concentrations to cancer cells. And this is because of the large glucose intake by cancer cells. And this is the very, very you know, basic concept of osmosis and diffusion because cancer cells will take in more glucose because they grow extremely fast. They're going to take in much more glucose than the other cells around them. The glucose concentration around cancer cells is going to be lower, which means even more glucose will keep gathering at cancer cells, around cancer cells. So that means that this guy is kind of like disguised as a glucose molecule and he's going to gather around whatever cancer cell there is, if it does exist. All right, so he's gathered at a cancer cell and he's found out where it is. Um, then what happens? Well, the radioactive isotope obviously decays in the body and it will release the beta plus particle as we've already said that it would. Um, the beta plus particle, which is a positron, it coll collides with nearby electrons and electrons are everywhere. So we don't have to worry about that. Positrons aren't everywhere. So we have to make it through radioactive decay. They are antiparticles of each other. Electrons and positrons are the antimatters of each other. They have the exact same mass and to a lot of in a lot of ways they seem like the same. They're both leptons, for instance, um, but they have opposite charges. And when they meet together, they annihilate each other and 100% of their mass is turned into electromagnetic energy. That's what happens um, in an anni annihilation of antimatter which means that, you know, because 100% of their mass just disappears, like the mass just disappears altogether and everything just becomes light. Um, that means that we can use Einstein's equation of E equals MT squared. So this is in the form of two gamma rays in this, in this um, specific case. Positron electron annihilation results in two gamma rays traveling in opposite directions to each other. I'm pretty sure you can tell that this is probably because of the conservation of momentum. So something like this goes on where you have an unstable parent nucleus, and in our case, this is fluorine 18. Um, 
and this produces a beta plus particle, which is also known as a positron. It collides with a nearby beta minus particle, an electron, and they annihilate each other, releasing gamma rays in opposite directions, which means 180 degrees to each other. So this is a pretty important fact that you might want to memorize. So as we all know, E equals mc squared. Now that we know that, we can actually find out the energy of the photons. So using E equals mc squared, we can find out the combined energy of both gamma rays. Remember that this is the combined energy. There are two gamma rays, and you have to remember that. So the energy is the mass combined, which means two times the mass of an electron, essentially, because they have the same mass. And then you take the speed of light, square it, and you get this. That's the energy of the total photons. Now the energy of one photon, you just divide it by two, and there you go. Now that we have the energy of a single photon, we can obviously find out the frequency of that specific photon as well. So the frequency is, you know, we have this very handy equation. So in order to get the frequency, you just divide the energy by Planck's constant. And this gives us approximately 1.2 times 10 to the power of 20 hertz. So that is what you can do. So now we've established that there is a radioactive tracer. It gets made into like a glucose kind of thing. And then it gets introduced into the body. And then it gathers itself around cancer cells. And then there is annihilation that happens, sending out gamma rays in 180 degrees to each other. What happens after that? And how do we detect it? Well, this entire reaction takes place inside the patient's brain or wherever else there is a, a, a cancer cell, right? But let's say that this is like a brain scan. So the patient is actually inside this ring of gamma ray detectors and they're all segmented. They're all separate gamma ray detectors. When an annihilation occurs, two gamma rays are sent out in opposite direction. They hit opposite detectors nearly at the same time, but not exactly. Um, unless they, they, you know... Their starting point is directly in the middle of the circle. If they say the starting point is like here, that's not directly in the middle of the circle. So they're going to have a slightly different time of impact because they're, they're traveling slightly different um, distances. But this is still going to be a very small time delay because the speed of light is literally 3 times 10 to the power of 8. So the detector detects the two um, that have very small, similar uh, arrival times. They use the equation speed as distance over time, and they use the minuscule differences in the arrival time between the two photons, and the computer will accurately detect where the annihilation took place. Now, positrons travel around one millimeter before losing nearly all of its energy, which means that this annihilation reaction that the computer was able to track and, and somehow determine the position of, it's likely to be one millimeter near the the place where all of the tracers were gathering. So, hence the tracer is likely to have been around one millimeter, around the point of annihilation. So, you have a plus minus one millimeter, and the computer can detect the uh, position of the radioactive tracer, essentially. So, cancer sites are active sites in tissue. They absorb large amounts of radioisotopes. Tracer concentration will then be higher here, and it will appear as a bright point on the image that's formed by the computer. This is how a cancer is detected of at early stages. It is exclusive for PET scans. This is very special because um, for x-rays or ultrasound, there's no way that you can detect cancer at an early stage, where all it is is just a tissue, and the tissue has a very similar density, a very similar acoustic impedance, or a very similar absorption coefficient in comparison to all the other tissues. And x-rays and ultrasounds, they all de de depend on these types of things. And then tissues are very similar, so it's unlikely that you can even find out if the tissue is cancerous using any other form of medical diagnosis. But PET scans take a completely different approach. They take a look at the rate of absorption of glucose of different types of tissues. And if there's an abnormal one, then they find out that this is actually a cancerous tissue, even at its early stages. So that's why it's so special. 
So that's amazing about PET scans, but what is a con is that you need cyclotrons in order to make the radioactive tracer. So because the half-lives of the tracers are very, very short, you don't want a half-life like a few years because then it will keep emitting gamma rays inside your body and gamma rays are high, highly energetic and they could actually cause ionization inside the patient's body. So you just want it to get over with as soon as possible. So they choose... Um, you know, certain radioactive tracers like fluorine 18 that have shorter half-lives. So because the half-lives are very short, there's no time to import them from another laboratory. You cannot say, oh, I'll import my radioactive tracers from another plant that manufactures them because the half-lives are so short that by the time that you get it to the patient, they're all going to be gone. Um, hence, the tracers need to be manufactured on demand in the hospital itself. So how do you do that? You use a cyclotron. This is the external view of a cyclotron. This is the inter internal view. Essentially, there is a very, very strong magnetic field. And, this, and then you put in a particle inside and the magnetic field will make it rotate and it'll get faster and faster and it'll accelerate. And then you will finally bombard it to a certain target. And this, I don't know, usually you use hydrogen. Since beta particles and beta positive particles are um, emitted when protons turn into neutrons, um, I would suspect that maybe a neutron is knocked out in order to, you know, make the need for a proton to turn into a neutron to, you know, balance the upsetting of the balance itself. So that's what happens. It requires a lot of energy. It requires some very hefty equipment. There has to be a vacuum in here or not. It will ionize the gas. So... Cyclotrons are expensive and it's hard to run it because the magnetic coil is so powerful that you need a lot of electricity. This is why it can be so costly to get a PET scan and why it's kind of hard to find a hospital capable of supporting the PET scan or the cyclotron in the first place. Um, despite that, it's still used because of the fact that you can, it can aid in the early detection of cancer. So I think that's about it for our video on PET scans. Hopefully it was helpful to you. And if you want more videos like this, you can check out the rest of my channel where I also post videos on A-level physics. Um, thank you very much for watching.